Well, good morning. So as we talk about Revelation 5 today, here's the big deal, and here's kind of the big picture, and Ron, if you need to take a nap after this, you're welcome to. Tracy, you scared me to death. I saw you coming up on me in that big truck this morning on the way to church, and then you're like, oh, it's the pastor, and he slowed down. <laughs> I thought I was going to have to turn on my windshield wipers and let you know that you're a little too close. <clears throat> That's very passive-aggressive. Does anybody else do the passive-aggressive windshield wiper move? I really would like my back windshield wiper just to point away from my car towards the car behind me, but I think that's illegal. Troy, any rules from the sheriff's office about that? Pretty bad. Okay, <clears throat> so don't do that. <clears throat> You're not allowed to throw gum out your sunroof or anything. I heard that um, motorcycle riders have marbles, and if you're too close to them, they'll drop marbles, so just... and nickels too. <laughs> oh my goodness gracious, the things I'm learning today. So I want to tell you what I told the kids, and I really wish, uh, I, I hope you can hang on to what I'm, what I'm going to say this morning, because here's the deal. You all, every one of you grew up with some wrong information. You, you, maybe you like me, you had a hillbilly family, and I told Mike, I, I, did, I guess I haven't told this story in a while, I told Mike, you know you're in a hillbilly family when one of the family stories is that when your dad was three years old, he accidentally got a chickpea stuck in his ear. And his uncle tried to blow it out from the other side. That's, yeah. So there's a lot of wrong thinking. But not just that. Things families said to each other. Um, like, you don't matter if you can't work. Or if you can't work hard. Or if you don't sweat. It's not a real job. Which is what we were told all our lives. If you don't sweat, it's not a real job. Which is great, because my brother and I are both pastors. And so we both struggle with, I guess I need to go sweat today. I don't know, maybe I should turn the air warmer in the church. But, and, and what happens though is if you're not careful, when you're a kid, maybe you had a coach that told you you're an idiot. Maybe you had a teacher because you struggled in school tell you you weren't smart. And they put all this wrong thinking on your plate. Maybe it was abuse. Maybe it was somebody saying something to you, or you just believed it about yourself for what, and you don't even know why. And you've got a plate full of all this negative garbage that you carry around with you, and you believe it about yourself. You believe this is who you are. And what's really cool about Revelation is we're getting a glimpse, just a glimpse of heaven. And in the first point today, we're going to talk about how people. Everybody in heaven basically realizes we can't do the basics to be here. And that's why Jesus came. And so today I want you to think about maybe some of your wrong thinking. By the way, your wrong thinking isn't always about you. Sometimes it's about other people. Like, like we tend to think people that don't agree with us are idiots, right? Come on, you've been on Facebook lately. You're like, hmm, right? You've been on Twitter lately. <laughs> Maybe threads, is that the newest thread, threads? You know, Instagram, TikTok. I'm trying to think of every social media service, right? Smoke, smoke signals. Anyway, so, you know, what's on your plate? And in Revelation, you get a glimpse of heaven. And the idea for us is to be able to reevaluate life and dump out all this wrong thinking we have about our own worthiness, about our own being able to, to be in God's presence, about trying to earn our ways to God, all this kind of stuff that we throw on our plate, or feeling inadequate, feeling like idiots, feeling like whatever word you hear. Um, when I would spill something at my house, my dad used to say, well, you pulled an Eric. So, so what did I think about myself? Well, I'm clumsy. Apparently, I'm clumsy. Apparently, I do dumb things. I've done a lot of dumb things, by the way. But that's not who I am. Do you, do you hear the difference? And so dump that and say, Jesus, as I get a glimpse of heaven, would you help me every day as I spend time in your word, as I spend time in prayer, as I just lift up my friends to you, as I give thanks to you, Lord, would you help me to dump out the, the wrong thinking the world throws at me and help me to make you first in my life? And so as we look at this idea today, we're going to talk about why we should worship Jesus, and I want to remind you that the whole purpose of Revelation is the fact that God wins, but it's also a book of worship to remind us of how awesome 
worship in heaven is. And even maybe while you're singing, it's terrible. Listen, you could be the best singer in this room in the nation. And compared to angels in heaven, your voice would be, eh. But God doesn't care. And so when you worship, I hope you'll get a glimpse of heaven and realize that you're celebrating with the angels. And so I want to talk about this idea that when you worship, when you recognize who Jesus is and you worship him, other things fall to the side. The distractions, we live in a world that's full of distractions, right? And, and it's easy to get frustrated about things that we can do nothing about. I heard Neil, uh, 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 the science guy. The Neil guy talking about a meteor that's coming in three years and after this tour might hit us the next time around. I mean, I'm like, what? And we can get worried about stuff that we can do nothing about. Or we can say, Jesus, I'm putting you on the plate. Everything else will fall into place. So just like going to a buffet, when you go to a buffet, if you're a fat guy or a smart guy, you look over the buffet first and then you fill your plate accordingly, right? You're like, vegetables? Pfft. There's key lime pie at the end. Why in the world would I put a vegetable on there, right? And so, and so I want you to your first choice of the day, your first choice of the week to be, I want the mind of Christ. I, I want to know Jesus. I want to worship him today. All the other things are secondary. And you'll find that you have more peace. If you're not a Christian, one of the things I'll tell you is a Christian who really is focusing on Christ will have more peace, more joy, believe it or not, more patience. You might even be at Publix and not compare yourself to who's in line the same time you are. I do that all the time. So here's number one. Jesus is worthy and victorious. Jesus is worthy and victorious. Revelation 5, 1 through 5. So join me as we read that right now. And I turn down the air one degree in here. By the way, aren't you glad we have air conditioning? One of our members called me this week. Their air conditioner went out. And I prayed for them and let them borrow an air condition if they wanted it. All right, let me put this on. All right. Then I saw, Jesus is worthy and victorious. Then I saw the right hand of him who sat on the throne, a scroll with writing on both sides. Now, that's pretty wild. That means the scroll is full. It's full of instructions from God. It, that wasn't a normal thing usually. And sealed with seven seals. Now, let me tell you what that means. In the Roman world... Legal documents, and especially, especially death documents, right? The will, right? Were sealed with seven seals. So that when they were broken, they knew that nobody had been into this document. It meant it, meant it was extra important. So it says, and I saw a mighty angel proclaiming in a loud voice, who is worthy to break the seals and open the scroll? By the way, you can look at Isaiah 6, 8 to see this, this follow-up on this discussion. But here's the deal. Angels are more powerful, have more strength than any of us. I mean, you look through Scripture, and what do the angels do? The angels wipe out whole armies. They, they do God's bidding for Him, right? Right? And yet the angel is saying, who's worthy? We're not worthy to break the seal. And then it continues, but no one in heaven, on earth, and if that's not enough, and under the earth could open the scroll or even look inside of it. I wept and wept because no one was found who was worthy to open the scroll or look inside. So here John is, he's entered into the presence of heaven an angel comes and says, nobody's worthy. And John recognizes, I'm not worthy either. No one is worthy. And so what does John do? John starts to bawl crying. I don't know if you've ever had one of those cries where you're <gasps> trying to catch your breath, right? And so this is that type of cry. He is recognizing that no one is worthy. And so he's like, what in the world? Now, he continues. Then one of the elders said to me, do not weep. See, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, by the way, you can go to Isaiah 11, that's where it mentions the root of David, has triumphed. He is able to open the scroll and its seven seals. Now, let me give you the big point for us. John weeps 
because he recognizes that he cannot do enough things. He cannot do anything to overcome the power of sin. If you have not recognized in your own life that even in your own life sometimes you're disappointed at yourself and your own actions. I mean, haven't you ever, but when you're leaving to go somewhere and you know, like, I'm going to get on I-95, Lord, today is going to be the day that I'm going to be patient. And then someone tries to merge. And you're like, nope. And, you're, and, you, and you recognize immediately, sometimes the things I aspire to, I don't do. And here's the deal about sin. No matter how much and how hard you work, you will never measure up to God's standard. And that is why we need Jesus. That's why a person can't pay for your sin. That's why your works, you cannot do enough good works to overcome your failures. What do you need? You need a savior. It's like being in a boat. I don't know if you've ever, I, I don't know if you've ever been in a boat that didn't have a ladder. Yeah, I made that mistake once. I was in somebody's boat, didn't have a ladder. And everybody said, let's jump out of the boat and swim. And I jumped out of the boat and then realized you can't get back in the boat. Thankfully, somebody was on the boat and helped me back in. But guess what? I wasn't getting on the boat on my own. By the way, I tried. Oh, it looked like a seal trying to get on shore. It was bad, right? And so that's the truth about us when it comes to works is you can't save yourself. You need Jesus. Now, if you think this is something new, I love that the Bible takes us all the way back. The book of Revelation all the way to Genesis is pointing to Jesus. How do I know that? Because here's Abraham talking to his kids, and he's talking to this son Judah, who, by the way, Jesus' uh, heritage would come out of this line. And here's what he says. Judah, your brothers will praise you. Your hand will be on the neck of your enemies. Your father's sons will bow down to you. You are a lion's cub, Judah. You return from the prey, my son. Listen, listen. Like a lion, he crouches and lies down like a lioness. Who dares to rouse him? And then it says this, this is talking about Jesus. The scepter will not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from Etina's feet, until he whom it belongs shall come, and the obedience of the nations shall be his. So from Genesis to Revelation, this messianic, we call it a messianic prophecy. It's about the Messiah coming. Way back in Genesis, the Messiah will come. And Jesus would be born in the Lion of Judah. And in Revelation, we're reminded who the Lion is. It's the Lion of Judah. But not only is he a lion, he's also a lamb. We're going to go there next. Number two, Jesus willingly sacrificed for us. So this week we had the 80th anniversary of D-Day. And um, my mom's cousin, she remembers going and visiting him before he left for D-Day. And I had always thought that he parachuted. We were always told he parachuted in the back. Well, I actually found yesterday morning, I found his military record. And when he died, and we don't know if he died on the beaches of Normandy or into France a little more. We know he, he died at the time what was considered D-Day. And here's what's amazing to me. She said, he was terrified to go, but he was willing to go. He knew the importance of what he was doing. So even though her cousin, who she called uh, Snooks, I think, was terrified to go, he was willing to go. And she remembered the story about the mom putting the wash on the line and seeing the soldiers come up the road and she passed out knowing that her son was gone. Jesus willingly gave his life for us. Listen to what it says here in Revelation 5, 7 through 10. He went and took the scroll from the right hand of him who sat on the throne. And when he had taken it, what happened? That We talked about it last week. The four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb. Each one had a harp. By the way, it's kind of cool. This word harp can also be translated guitar. It's basically a stringed instrument. So and it could be a harp. It could be they were jamming out. We don't really know. Okay, sorry. I had to throw that out there for those of you who like Journey. All right. Um, Steve Perry was at a baseball game yesterday and was singing along with his own song, which was really cool to see. All right. Anyway, I'm sorry. That's so 80s of me to mention all of that. 
And they were holding, now listen to this, golden bowls full of incense, which are prayers of the people. So this is imagery, this is an illustration, and here's what it's saying. Those, that incense that these elders are holding is what? It is the prayers of God's people. You ever feel like God hasn't answered your prayers? You ever feel like your prayer didn't matter? See, incense is something that God goes, I like that. In the temple, there was incense, the smell of incense. You would have known when somebody had been in the temple because of the smell of incense. And I don't know if you've ever been to one of those soap stores. That is the worst smell I've ever been a part of. But one of my favorite stores is the candle store where they have Yankee candles and they always have like the coolest one lit. And as long as they don't light that lavender one, I'm fine. Lavender one makes me sneeze. But I walk in there and they got the vanilla one going and I'm like, <laughs> or they got the one that smells like Christmas cookies, right? You're like, oh. The Bible says that that's how God sees your prayers, like the vanilla cookie candle. It's that incense. And then it continues... And they sang, listen to this, a new song. For, for those of you who think your style of worship is more important or better, or it's what everybody else should sing, I just want you to know in heaven, they're going to do one we haven't even done yet. And you're still going to go, but God, we should sing the old songs that I used to sing when I was a kid. And he's going to be like 3,000 years ago. And you realize when you say, I like the old songs, you realize in heaven there's going to be Gregorian monks who are going to be like, okay, let's go. In Monte Ali. And you're going to be like, well, no, no, no. I mean the ones that I think are old. Oh, so personal preference. Yes. And so God gets through all of that and he's like, you know what? We'll just write a whole new song. We'll just, we'll just write. Maybe it'll include all of it. Right? And then it continues. They, they sang a new song. Saying, you are worthy to take the scroll and open its seals because you were slain and with your blood you purchased for God persons from every tribe and language and people and nation. And listen to that. That could, refers once again back to that passage in Genesis. It also refers to Isaiah 53, 7 where it talks about him being a lamb. You have made them to be a kingdom of, what's the next word? Oh, you fell asleep. Okay, we'll try it again. They made him to be a kingdom and priest to serve our God and they will reign on earth. In the Dead Sea Scrolls, they, they had examples of what worship was like in the early church. And a lot of times they made up new songs. They wouldn't have had songs. So they would make them based on what was going on or what was happening. They would write new songs. And not only would they write new songs, they wrote new songs. And when they sang, they would imagine that they were singing with the angels in heaven. And so John's trying to give you this reminder of who Jesus is. He, see, he knew the lamb. Jesus, remember, John would call himself Jesus' favorite. I love, in the, I love in the book of John, John continually would say, you know, the disciple Jesus loved. Like some of you do with your siblings. You know, the one mom likes best. You know, that one, right? And so John's like that. And then here he comes in Revelation and he's, he's remembering all the works of Jesus. Have you ever had a traumatic event in your life? When I was a little kid, I was in a car accident. My brother was driving. We were on the way to school. I still remember specifically that morning, the skidding in the station wagon with the, with the brown sides, because we like that fake wood look, and, and looking for seatbelts, which of course it was the 70s, so they were tucked in because you didn't actually use the seatbelts, so you tucked them in because they would just be in your way, right? And I remember reaching for the seatbelts for the first time and thinking, I need a seatbelt. And sure enough, on the way to school, a guy was turning left and then came right at us. He totaled our car. My brother hit the windshield. My sister broke her nose on the dash. My other sister gashed her head open. And I'll never forget getting out of the car on this rainy day in Miami and looking at my sister. And she goes, my head hurts. Am I okay? And I said, you look oh." And then blood came flowing from her head. I will never forget that. 
It is a vivid memory to this day, as you can tell. And I remember specific little things. Realize that when John is talking about the lamb who was sacrificed, he remembers the cross. He remembers Jesus' death. He remembers all the prayers, all the things Jesus told them ahead of time. Here's one of the ones that John wrote down in the book of John. John chapter 3, when he was a little bit younger. Here's what he said. He said, Jesus said this, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes, and that's the word for faith, in him will not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. So in the book of John, John's reminding us, God loves you. That's the reason Jesus came to die. And in the book of Revelation, he's reminding us, you can't earn your way to heaven. It's about surrendering to him, understanding that you need not only the lion, but you need the lamb who is willing to sacrifice for you. Number three, he deserves to be worshipped. Now, the truth is, in our flesh, in who we are, we tend to worship ourselves. We call that selfishness and self-centeredness. We tend to be that way. Just like I've taught many people how to drive, and I'll never forget teaching my friend Ruby how to drive, and we're in the truck. Her parents, for whatever reason, didn't want to teach her to drive, but she said, Eric can teach you how to drive, which they had misplaced their trust. That's all I'm telling you. And so I'll never forget, we went to this abandoned road in Miami, in the middle of nowhere, and I got in the passenger seat, and Ruby got in the driver's seat, and instantly, as she's driving, she ran the truck off the road into the woods, and the woods are hitting the side of the car, and I grab the wheel and pull it back on. And here's what I've come to realize, because I've taught all my kids to drive, some of my nephews and nieces, all this kind of stuff. Here's what I've realized. When you've been sitting in the passenger seat all your life, you think you're supposed to be what was comfortable to you back then. And so you tend to drive off the road. And so I've had to teach people, don't look over there at that right side. You're either look at the left or look across. Some people talk about looking across the hood or whatever. And most of you this morning didn't even think about where you were driving. You just know where you're at. Why? Because you've gotten in that habit. Here's the thing. When you give your life to Christ, the Bible says you become a brand new creature. You, you are given his righteousness. But you have old habits. And some of your old habits include selfishness and self-centeredness. And you have to lift that up to God and go, God, would you remind me to worship you and not worship me? Lord, when the selfish Eric, when I make the plate all about me and all about my needs and my wants and my desires and my stuff, help me to dump the plate and put you first. And then the Bible says, and all these things will be added to you as well. So let's see what it happens next. Then I looked up and heard the voice, I love this, of many angels numbering thousands upon thousands and 10,000 times 10,000. By the way, in the Greek, 10,000 times 10,000 was like infinity. It's like when you got in a fight with somebody, you're like, affinity with a cherry on top. That's kind of what this is, okay? So it's so many you can't count. They encircled the throne and living creatures and the elders, in a loud voice, they were saying, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise. Time out. Those are all things that in our selfishness we desire for ourselves. So what worship does is it takes it from God, it's about me, to Jesus, it's about you. Jesus, it's about you. I want you to have power in my life. I want you to have all the money, all the stuff. I want you to have the wisdom. I want you to have the strength. Lord, and here's what's awesome about God. When you give that all to him, guess what? He pours that back into you. It's an amazing thing how God works. And then it continues. Then I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and on the sea and all that is in them saying to him who sits on the throne and to the lamb be praise and honor and glory and power forever and ever. The four living creatures said amen, which basically means I agree, by the way. Did you know that? Amen is like, yep, that's true. If you were country, it'd be like, yep. Okay. So amen. By the way, don't, don't do that when you're praying with people. They'll freak out if you go, yep. Okay. Anyway. 
Amen. And the elders fell down and worshiped. Listen to what it says in Daniel 7, talking about Jesus. He was given authority, glory, and sovereign power. All nations and peoples of every language worshiped him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away, and his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. Every once in a while, somebody will say to me, you know, Jesus never said that he was God, or Jesus never said he was the Savior. And then I just refer them to this verse. Because Jesus, in this verse, uh, they say this is the lunatic or liar passage, C.S. Lewis used to call this. Because Jesus is either who he says he is at this point, or he is crazy. And here's what Jesus says. Jesus answered, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you really knew me, you'd know my Father as well. From now on, you do know him and have seen him him. This is at the Last Supper. John is recalling that Jesus said, I am the way. Now, why does worship matter? Because here's the deal. If you're a Christian, when you put all your stuff on this plate, you become selfish and self-centered. And if you really are a Christian, I believe you become miserable because God wants you to be miserable until you trust him. And so when you start filling this plate with your stuff and your thoughts and you this, what does God want you to do? Jesus, I want to make you first. I want to spend time in your word. I want to spend time in prayer. I want to allow you to change me. And here's what's really cool. When you begin to fill this plate with the things of God, other people start to go, what's on your plate? I mean, I've had this plate for a long time. It's full of negative thinking. Is full of selfishness and self, and I'm just not happy. What's on your plate? I want some of what's on your plate. Years ago, I had a student named Christine. She was in our youth group. She, her parents were both atheists. They did not go to church at all. So she started coming to youth group because of a boy. And so she came to youth group, and then she decided to go to camp. And she actually wrote me a letter recently, and she said, and I thought it was pretty hokey to be honest. And I'm like, thanks a lot for that. But then she gave her life to Christ. It radically changed her life. She was going to drop out of high school at that point. I never knew that part of the story. She was actually going to drop out of high school because everybody told her she was so dumb. And God changed her life. She not only graduated high school, she then went to college. She then married a Christian young man. She now teaches Sunday school at a church and plays piano and has two kids who are growing up in church. And you, if you met her today, you would see the joy on her face because she took the selfish, self-centered plate she had and dumped it and said, I like what's on your plate. God, I want to worship Jesus. And she surrendered her life to him and he's radically changed her life. If you're here today and you're ready to throw away what you've been seeking, you're ready to get rid of your selfishness and surrender your life to Christ, I'd love to talk to you after the service about what it means to be a Christian. And even as a Christian sometimes, listen, if you're here and you're a Christian today, it's easy to allow selfishness and self-centered, those old habits to sneak back in. All you do is confess it to him and say, God, forgive me for thinking only about me and my selfishness. I surrender my life to you. I want to make room for you. We're going to close in prayer. We're going to have a time of giving, but I'll be here after the service. If you need prayer, I'd be glad to pray for you. Would you join me as we pray? Father, thank you for this time today. I thank you for your word. I thank you for your love for us. Father, I thank you for the glimpse of heaven. And Lord, I pray that in our lives today, we would recognize that in our lives, we can have just a touch of heaven each day. Lord, I know there's folks here who are desperate for your presence. Lord, would you just touch their lives? Father, you said you're the God of all comfort. So I pray for those who need comfort today that you would give them your comfort. For those who need strength, that you would give them your strength. But Lord, most of all, we choose to worship you today. Thank you for this time. In Jesus' name, amen.